Can't hush the Duke. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. I tried a deliberate opener this time, and, you know, it was, it was new and different. While Norm and I were in Vegas, one of the things we did was went out in the desert and flew uh, multi-rotors. Oh, yes. And we flew, well, we flew like DJI stuff, which yeah. at this point I feel like we're pretty comfortable with. We've flown the yeah. Phantom a lot. Norm and I had a race where we put on the FPV goggles. How is that? Is it like a pod race? Oh, my God. It's the best. It is. Um, those glasses and technology for that, you can see few years down the line how amazing that's going to be. The cameras are going to get better. The cameras right now they're using are basically security cameras because that's where you get low latency. They're like it's 5 gigahertz analog. analog. 5.8 gigahertz or they do 2.4. Um, but the exposure is not perfect on those. Oh, well, yeah. And so the people who do the races right now, they fly both indoor and outdoor. Some of them will go in warehouses and then out windows. Dude. And if you can't get the exposure to correct fast enough, it's going to look blown out. You won't know you're flying into a tree. Oh. So when we were flying, one of the trickiest things was the sun was setting and past like the third turn, we'd see the sun and we'd both be blinded and we'd try to navigate. Okay, so amazing. turn. Are you flying around flags? So we, yeah, we, flags. they had flags placed and you could go okay. high, low. You did like oh, it was, it was man. their infinite posts, right? So you could go as high as you want as long as you went around the flag. It's, there's nothing like flying someone else's $1,300 quad <laughs> yes. as fast as you can. Wow. Wild, reckless abandon. Can you tell where the other person oh, yeah. is? Um, you could see the shadows. Like the sun was so far behind us that you could uh, see the shadow wait, of the wait, other wait, quad. Not if they're behind you. But not if they're behind. <laughs> you. Could but you tell you where I was? How close they might be. The, yeah, with shadows. Yeah. It was. It was basically just. The, the thing is, in the moment, you're going so fast and you're focused so hard on a not crashing somebody else's thirteen hundred dollar quad, but b winning. Yeah. That all I you know, it's just like what's the angle on the turn, and yeah. it's three dimensional, and am oh I'm grazing. Everybody starts yelling because suddenly you're grazing six inches above the ground, and they're like, "Good, get up, get up, get up!" <laughs> um, oh my god, it was sounds like it was so super fun. fun. Are you flying like this, or are you flying like? No, this? we're flying the the oh, normal normal controller, okay. and um. I like I Norm went out a couple weeks ago with Eric Chang and some some other folks to do some That's a great, great FBB yeah. racing, and I understand why he came back so stoked about it because like I'm I am I finished the race and I went right back I was like I want to I want to do this some more. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, my my inspire arrives soon. Oh, that's that thing's that's like a gunboat. We I want I want the little tiny super fast ones. Oh, both. I uh, I'm yeah. psyched about the inspire one. I want to take it somewhere oh, and go boat. look at some stuff from. Yeah, from take take your battleship. Away. I'll I'll take my little <laughs> PT boat or whatever. Um, so speaking of quads, speaking of quads, new season of MythBusters. <laughs> yes, nice segue. Um. I guess that you guys fly octos there when you when you fly. We do. Uh, our cameraman Duncan Clark has an octocopter uh, that he built. He just basically. built a new one, right? Uh, or I upgraded. Believe so maybe? I believe he's currently building a new one over okay. the holiday before we come back to shooting. Uh, and it has. It, it started out. He had a plane. But we lost the plane during Duct Tape Canyon. <laughs> the first one? Yeah. No, okay. uh, that's Duct Tape Island was the first oh, okay. one. Duct Tape Canyon was we shot in uh, Utah. Okay. Um, and. He was flying it down a river, and then he wasn't. Wow, mm. plane. Yeah. That's even riskier. And it was cool. I mean, yeah. we got some great oh, yeah. shots. And in fact, actually, you can see some fantastic shots from that plane. We used them in Dangerous Toys, the pilot that Jamie and I did uh, last year. Um, and Duncan has... So eventually, he took uh, he took the, uh, the impetus he had for the plane, and he put it into an octocopter, which he's been slowly upgrading and making bigger and bigger and bigger. Now he's got a really... I'd say it's like almost twenty pounds. Yeah, he was he was working on it when we were there to shoot the Ebola PSA, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. And it was I mean, it is a it is a big monster that you can put a real camera on and yeah. he said he has good good hit linger time and all that stuff. Yeah, and it is he's he's gotten really good at it. You know, because it's you're not just flying something that has a camera on it. You're also a cameraman, which means <laughs> yes. every frame has to tell a story. Yes. And so you can't just, you know, while it might be interesting to pan across the city. If it's in an episode, there has to be a reason it's panning across the city, which means you have to keep in mind what you've got. That's actually one of the things I'm super exci excited about the Inspire One is that 
it comes with dual controllers. So you can have a cameraman controlling the camera shot while a guy is actually... Well, it doesn't, it doesn't come with him, but you can get that as an... Oh, yeah. you, you notice that if you watch a lot of these quadcopter montages, and there are plenty of them, really beautiful ones around San Francisco, around the world, where places where some of the regulation may be a little laxer. Yeah. Um, the shots they choose are... You can tell they're restricted by like battery time. Like they did... You know, they, they did as many shots above this as they could, and then they got maybe three seconds they can use, right. and then it gets cut off right at the end. And so they're not fulfilling the potential of this because everyone's still learning. Yeah. They're learning how to use these well. It's like any other tool of, of film, right? Like it took it took 10 years before we learned how to use the crash zoom and, and you know, stuff like that. And it's, it's one of the things Duncan and I were talking about. He said he wanted to make one that was that was that that had a payload large enough to be able to handle a red camera. And I thought about that overnight. I thought, well, first I thought that's really cool because, you know, red is a cinema, cinema quality ready camera. Then I realized you don't need to put a red on that. You, you don't need to make it any heavier, any more of a payload than can hold a black magic with mm -hmm. a nice prime lens on it. First mm -hmm. of all, because you're almost 99% of what you're going to do is in daylight. Second of all, if you're, if it's a flying shot, it's a master shot, which means you're not going to use more than four or five seconds of it at the most. Right. So... With the black magic at daylight, that's where it shines. And it's you not shoot great in pro with low light, but it's great with the what's that? You shoot in pro res. So you, yeah. they, as long as the camera shoots in some type of raw video format, exactly. Post processing does a lot of the work. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, but, but the, the 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 flying machine with the smaller and smaller, higher quality cameras is both a really exciting pair of developments commensurate with each other, and they've given us a tremendous amount of extra production value on MythBusters. Well, so. This episode, uh, so we're recording this the Monday after the Simpsons episode. Yes, premiered. our season premiere, the Simpsons episode. And I think this is probably going to go up not tomorrow, but Tuesday following. Okay. Because the conversation we had earlier, I think, probably needs to be more timely than this one. I mean, it's up to you, kind of, No, I let's guess. put this one up. Okay. Let's so, put this one up tomorrow. Okay, so then we're not yeah. going to... Uh, so this is two... You're, you're hearing us talk about this 24 hours later. After, yeah. Yeah. I have the Mythbusters episode aired. Um, we were... I'm really proud of that I, episode. I, proud of this whole season. It was... Um, it was a dramatic change in, it, like, as Gina said, Gina hasn't watched a ton of Mythbusters because it's kind of out of her wheelhouse. But we were watching it on Saturday night. And she was like, "This seems this seems a little bit more kind of mature, not 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 in terms of tone and and dialogue and stuff, but in terms of like how it's shot and how it's produced and post processing and post effects and stuff like that. Like it was, it, it looked like a different show. It did, in and, a lot of and ways. to us, it feels like we're making a, a different show, and you know. We looked at a lot of the things that we've been doing. You get into patterns, just like any relationship. You, you, you get, get a rut. Ruts. Yeah. And we had our way of making the show. And at the beginning of last year, we really looked at every assumption we made about the show and looked at ways we could change it, make it better, make it more informative, but not just informative, but tell the story deeper. Hold on. <laughs> Gesundheit. Excuse me. Um, but so so that's that's in, that's interesting because one of the things that you did that I don't think you would have done before is when you you built a scale model of the toy of the three toilets. So yeah, it was Simpsons myths. Um, spoilers, by the way. Spoilers, yes. If you haven't seen it, spoilers. But come on, um, I'm just going to talk about it. You tested the cherry bombs exploding. Bart throws uh, a cherry bomb in the toilet, and it makes all of the toilets in the school gush like geysers. And mm -hmm. we we tested that. Yes, uh, you did Homer blocking the bowling ball. Homer the blocking the his, wrecking yes, ball. Homer ball. protects his house from a wrecking ball by putting his body between his house and the wrecking. Uh, ball. Was that it? Was there one more? No, no, it was just those, those were two. just those two. Um, and so in the process of doing the toilet cherry bomb myth, you built scale models of toilets. And then you took a moment and you explained how toilets work. Yes. Which is something that I don't think you would have done before. Maybe not, or maybe not no, quite no, as explicitly. I, we have more time to do it. Yeah. That is really simply that, that, that difference. Um, but that's something that I guarantee you a significant portion of the audience was like, oh, that's how the toilet works. It's just a crook. Yes. And Personally, for me, when I found that out, I was like, really? Because people it? are like, how could a rat crawl up a toilet? It can because there's no water except for at the toilet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it's these things you didn't realize. You just think past water equals mystery. Yeah. <laughs> right? it goes, and I thought that for years. It's, it's, and then it's no. in kids' books. It's like you, the poop goes down the pipes into the sewer and then it's gone. Right. But right. not so much. No. Um, and that's been really, really 
entertaining because we have the time to go in and talk about that stuff and do that. And then also, as we've said in every interview we've done about this season, um, because Jamie and I are providing 100% of all the content, uh, there's space again for the process, for building stuff. And that was very apparent in the early episodes of Mythbusters. Mm -hmm. And as we've gotten, the only reason that's disappeared from the episodes we've made since then is because we tell more complicated stories. There's more mm -hmm. narrative beats to hit. And there's not enough time to show how Jamie built a cool table saw rig to make this thing or how yeah. Adam problem solved the pneumatics three different times and kept screwing it up. Well, you showed Jamie, Jamie's giant ridiculous drill hole, hemispherical hole driller. Wasn't that awesome? That was rad. Yeah. I mean, that was super good. And I, I think, feel like that's another one of those things that wouldn't have been shown or no. maybe would have just been in the background. Well, we were also thinking about we went back and forth. We had the ability to buy something and just fill it with concrete. There, there, there are things we could buy. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jamie, again, thinking through the model from this new perspective of like, oh, we could actually cover a complicated build enough to tell the very interesting story. And Jamie's like, all right, let me think of a really weird and cool way to make a concrete ball. We could do it this way. And, you know, once Jamie gets excited, Oh yeah, shit yeah. gets real. It's unstop uh, He's unstoppable. Yeah, no, and th I thought that was a fantastic and an awesome and beautiful build, and the final result was great. Well, in the amount of time, I mean, just the amount of time, because I'm sure it was a full day out there to dig the hole, pour the concrete, and then another full day to come back out and and you know break it out. And probably somebody drove out a couple of times in between to make sure it had dried, yep, cured yep, appropriately. Yep. And then there's all the problem solving of the metal structure inside and how those are going to join together, and then how you're going to fill it with concrete, yeah. etc. And then James got to polish his balls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you had to put some tape on the outside. You had to tape his ball. We had to um, tape up his balls. A lot of people don't realize that from a production standpoint, you allow your camera team and the production team to experiment when you're not shooting the show. And that happens constantly. We talk about the quad copies. I wouldn't say we allow them. There's You can't stop our camera team. Yeah. Uh, and, and, so, and that's something that shows yeah. now, like, you know, with time lapses and, and dolly movements and stuff like that. We, ha we, we have been blessed on Mythbusters over the years. And I don't know if we've talked about the camera, but... You know, you're on when you're a television personality, you have a relationship to the camera, which means you have a relationship to the cameraman. And I've been doing this long enough. I could work with a cameraman who's not a nice person. I luckily only had to ever do that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it's really important you have a good relationship with your cameraman. You know, you guys work with Joey, and it's like that that dialogue, even the silent dialogue, is super critical. We've been really blessed, and we've had a series of awesome producers. And then, but then we've also worked with people who are like outside contractors, who sometimes get in in a pinch when schedules and they don't, don't work. Speak the same language, and it's it, usually the biggest. It's, it's shorthand, right? It is literally that. Oh, we want to do the this shot, and I don't even have to tell Joey because he knows. Oh, he's working over his shoulder, and it's, yeah. it's this is the way to do that. And and our camera crew, it's comprised of Scott Sorensen, who's our A camera. He started with us as a runner. He was on Octobercast 2013, I yes. think. Yeah, he came. Yeah. Uh, Willie Nail, who also started with us as a runner. Uh, he's our second camera. Uh, and uh, 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 Duncan Clark, who also started as an intern. <laughs> we, we, we have a real farm team on Mythbusters. But th it's good. That's a, oh, that's no, a great way to hire people. better, yeah. right? Because they've gotten to really get the whole thing from the ground up, and they've become such great storytellers with camera. And more than that, they're super inspired. So on any given weekend, you can go in and find Scott, like, you know, all those little Mythbusters interstitials before the commercials mm -hmm. where the cars are on the fake highway? Like, yeah. Scott just goes and does that on the weekends. Um, and, you know, Duncan is like, he brings that octocopter no matter where we go. And as frequently, we don't bring it out during the day. Has he flown it inside that big that big building that you did the Star Wars episode in? Uh, the Star Wars episode. Uh, he's flown it inside a few buildings. Okay. Um, we flew it inside... There are definitely some shots of it when we did the A Team special, which will air in a couple of weeks. Okay, uh, and that was shot inside a wood shop in a, an ex wood shop in an abandoned military base here in the Bay Area. Wow! Um, and that was that Probably was probably haunted. That was a, that was a thing to fly it indoors. It's totally it's totally it's very loud and oh, it's yeah. very scary. Yes, oh, yeah. those things. They're not toys. Um, they are not toys, not at all. So Norm alluded to you You guys, you've changed the way you're shooting the show. You're showing a... Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So th that's when we talked about the camera crew, one of the things that we we went to them and said, you know, what, what kind of things could we do to get a different look? And understand, 
if camera is your passion, you're reading and inculcating yourself with your favorite cameraman, your favorite movies. So they wanted, and we wanted to give the show a different look and the look was much more cinematic. And by that, I mean, um, specifically more bouquet, more depth of field. Sure. And that means where the foreground elements are in focus and the background isn't. Now that's anathema to standard reality television where those Sony cameras, those guys wear over their, hold on their shoulders. The lens is more expensive than the camera. It's like a $50,000 lens. And it's that expensive because it's incredibly good in low light, fast focus, fast iris change. And you want that. You don't want something to happen in the background and then you've got to zoom in, focus, and iris to get it right. It, it automates stuff like that for you. But on Mythbusters, where we're setting up shots of the car driving by, we don't have to use infinite focus GoPros and those A cameras. We can use Black Magics with mm -hmm. Primes. We yep. can use much more... Uh, uh, FS700 uh, or... Yeah, yeah FS700 yeah, for, for even more high speeds. You can it's, shoot different shutters. You can show particle particles flying everywhere. Different frame rates that slow down at certain mm -hmm. parts. Exactly. So one of the things that we'll do, what, that, we've, that we've been doing is, like, for the toilets... We shot those toilets uh, in a day, the scale toilets in a day in the shop. And then Jamie and I went out and started building the large scale toilet, but we didn't bring the whole camera crew. We left, I can't remember who it was. We left one camera and one of our shop guys back in the shop to keep doing toilet explosions to get a whole <laughs> bunch more really juicy <laughs> high speeds of yeah. the water moving. That's how those come out. Because each one of those takes a lot of time to set up and yeah. you gotta color the water and you gotta get the lights ready. Um, and, and then that's, you got to clean up afterwards. Right. And yeah. so that's the kind of stuff we've been doing. Lay, being able, having a three-member camera crew gives us the luxury of being able to go back over that stuff and pull out just some of the most awesome shots. How involved are you in the uh, post-production, the, uh, the signposting? The signposting, uh, not incredibly. I mean, We'll talk to the camera very specifically before we're doing anything and explain carefully to the editors and to Katie uh, back in Sydney who does the... Um, who does the animations mm -hmm. and does that 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 beautiful tracking, beautiful tracking shots of the of the measurements appearing? Mm -hmm. This next week, which is the Indiana Jones special, shows this in like some of yeah. my favorite details. This is where you braid the whip. This is where I make. Oh, the nice! Whip. I've seen footage. I've we seen did a teaser of that, of that yeah. at yeah. Comic Con. Um, so if they have questions, they call us up and they ask us. But again, that's also the post-production team getting excited about the science and the engineering and the, 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 the mechanics and layering in even more because they're interested in it. So I watch it and I go, oh, that's totally cool. And so it's, it's not like, you know, there's a single person just layering all of this in. It is, it is each member of the crew taking that responsibility. Turns out all that stuff that you write down when you're fucking around gets put on screen. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, there's a lot of, um, every time we finish an episode, all that footage goes to Australia and some poor kid has to sit there and sift through hours and hours I, and hours. I assume, what, like 10 or 12 hours, 20 hours probably? Well, more? it depends. I mean, on, of main camera footage uh, and second camera coverage, it's probably not a ton. But when you talk about... 10 GoPros and Black Magics placed all over the Alameda runway. Mm -hmm. Each is rolling for a, its full battery or SD card of mm -hmm. footage. Um, sometimes we'll, we we uh, we hone that before sending it, but sometimes we run out of time and someone's just got to sift through it. Wow. So there's definitely times though where we bring the A camera and we wave so that they know this is important. And we're like, editors, editors, pay attention. What we're about to do is this and this and this. Now you realize you could cut it in one of two ways. You might want to cut this bit before that bit, but you might want to cut it after. So I'm going to give you two pieces of the camera uh, so you could cut it either way. Oh my goodness. That's, so, yeah, that's the kind of writing we, communication. Well, we have to do that on the fly. Oh, and then also I'm, I'll make fun of them for being Australian. And then you got to make sure you got to do some good claps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so the thing that's interesting to me about that is you, you guys are doing the same thing that we do on a much larger scale. Because like when we, the reason we can produce as much video as we do is that when we're walking around shooting stuff, Joey is editing it in his head as he's right. shooting it. So he's he is shooting it in a way that it is easy to edit and fast. And and you guys are doing that to a different end to tell stories across continents and and well and let's talk the, that that editing is interesting because your neighbor is doing some oh right table sawing it sounds neighbor. like um, your ears are definitely getting better yes the uh, 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 wait wait where were we 
Oh, editing. So, right. So, look, the world is full of camera people. And some of them, their job for something like the Kardashians... Look, I don't know. Maybe if you're camera for cameraman for the Kardashians, I might be wrong. But for a lot of these reality shows, it's button on, mm -hmm. button off when you're out of tape or Blu-ray. Assume, or assume like Top Chef or something like that, yeah. where they're in a confined environment. There's like 20 people in yeah. there, and that's that's being edited by a director in the truck. That's being, you know, it's basically the, all the footage is being grabbed. Mm -hmm. um, on MythBusters, we don't have that luxury. We have one main camera. We have two cameras for discussions between Jamie and I, so we don't have to redo them, and that keeps it more natural. But uh, uh, for the most part, our cameramen have to think like editors. And that means um, something has to be moving in the shot all the time. You'll notice my favorite shots are the ones where it's like, you know, let's say it's raining during the lawnmower episode last year. Or was it this year? I don't think Lawnmowers aired yet. Uh, Has it? Dun, dun, I don't think dun. it's aired. I haven't seen oh, okay. it. We have a Lawnmower it's, episode yeah, airing later on this year. <laughs> and like it was raining. It was we are out there and it was raining. It was raining so hard we actually had to talk about it narratively because it was affecting <laughs> oh. the experiment. And that means that Scott now has to go out and get shots that say it's raining. Hey guys, it's really raining. What does hard. that mean? Yeah. That usually means you want to go find a puddle with everyone working in the reflection of the puddle. You want to find the water dripping. And so Scott, just like every time we're not actually shooting, he's out there getting establishing shots of rain for the editors to keep on being able to keep your mind understanding it's raining. That's awesome. That's all part of the you guys know. It's, it's all part visual of the visual medium. language yeah. of, of what you're of what you're talking about. And the 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 cameramen that work well on Mythbusters are the ones that the editor gets stuff, and it's like, wow, it's almost a cut sequence. Like, um, I mean, you can put a monitor. That's on not top to say it. that there's not a ton of work to be done in the editing. Oh bay. God, no, no, yeah. no, 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 because that's all about the timing and stuff, right? right? You but, guys are just setting them up to then succeed and make the pieces. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just remember our first cameraman, Paul Henry, who's uh, an amazing, amazing cameraman and one of the sweetest humans alive. Uh, and was so great as like a trainer and cameraman for us because we'd finish and take the camera and he'd just look over and go, I thought that was great. <laughs> That's a, that, and that and when you're starting out and you haven't done because Norman and I did this too. Like we started out with no video experience basically. Yeah. And there are three months of videos on that YouTube channel that are pretty bad. Well, it's like at uh, best. It's, it's like in the beginning you hold stuff up. You're like, now this is a mechanic and. The, the, yeah. oh, you do like this. This is a mechanical thing, and the cameraman has to teach you. In in television, you have to go like this. This, yeah. and you have to hold it close to your and face because no one wants it over here. Nope. You have to hold it close to your face, and you have to turn it so that you can see. I mean, it's all of these things that you learn. Or sometimes they want it really close to your face right? <laughs> or really far away from your face, so it's all by itself. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, I mean, it's two different, yeah. Uh, so with Paul Henry, uh, we would put a monitor sometimes on top of his camera so the producer could see what he's shooting and say, you know, cut that to a little to the left because I want to see more of that. But for the most part, with someone like Paul or specifically Scott Sorensen, you look at a monitor of what he's filming and every shot looks like it belongs on television. Yeah. There's no like every shot's every shot tells a story. That's the key when you're filming stuff. It's not just, oh, there's R2D2's head. It's R2D2's head within the cave. I'm just looking at the shot that I'm seeing here. And the cameraman has to choose a point of view. And that point of view will make the shot interesting or not. So the other thing that changed in the 10, 12 years since you guys started Mythbusters is everybody went from having standard def TVs to high def TVs. Yeah. Um, and I know you guys went to high def, what, probably six, seven years ago, it Something seems like, like now. I can't quite remember now, but yes, um, no, everything's on high def. But I mean, the thing that's happened that I've noticed happening in the last couple of years on sports and news and stuff like that is that the TV, com the, the, the TV uh, companies in general, the the production companies, yeah. I guess. Manufacturers. Uh, no, no, no. no. Oh. Like ESPN, oh, the right. networks. Yeah. Yeah. The networks have changed the way that they're doing, like on sports stuff, they're now using the full width of the screen. Right. Whereas for a long time on ESPN, if you watched a football game, oh, the, the overlays the, yeah, right. would be 4-3 and then there'd just be some extra stuff, extra video on the side. Yeah. Have you guys changed how you're shooting the show to take advantage of HD or did that happen a long time ago? I and, think that happened a long time okay. ago. Um, we did... 
Well, obviously we have a crap ton of GoPro cameras. Mm -hmm. Um, And GoPro, by the way, we have never had easy relationships with the phones and the cameras and the- It doesn't work well. It just, it's very difficult. (laughs) If you leave the the phone connector on- Yeah, 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 the camera always conks out. Like that's the thing we found is if you leave the phone connected, 30 minutes is that hard limit yeah. before the so, thing implodes. But we use tons of GoPros. This season, we got many more Blackmagic cameras and so, with prime lenses <laughs> on them. And we use them much more as our GoPros. So f- there's some driving myths coming up this year. I think this current season ends with an episode about drifting, which is Ooh. amazing. And Jamie and I got trained how to drift by <sighs> Formula One drift champion, Conrad Grunwald, who became a good friend. And he's an amazing guy. Wow. We have stuff from inside with black magics close up from inside the cars mm. so it's just like oh, it's so beautiful no distortion no dis- mm. yeah yeah that- and again that cinematic feel to it are you guys um, using those black magic cameras like like i mean because i know you kind of use the gopros like they're they're not exactly disposable but they're kind of disposable. we're not using the black magics in place where we expect bad things to happen okay but again we also have camera housings that we've built for stuff padded camera housings uh, and black magics, there's a there's an aluminum over case you can buy for them. All mm-hmm. of ours have are heavily okay. armored for this. Um, but yeah, we, we it, it, uh, so let's see, let's see. Uh, process, mm-hmm. uh, the camera work, the camera look, uh, the extra time to put in the the more facts, more supporting material that helps the audience understand. I mean, for us, it's. It's not like it's it's not at all like we've been chopping at the bit to make the show this mm-hmm. way. It's more like you get used to making something in a certain way and that's not always good. You can get vanilla, you can get comfortable. Well, and- you I mean you said something a couple of years ago when when you first started talking about this I think privately. Yeah. Um that you said you know you realized that you'd gotten too good at myth busting when you knew the answer to the to the myth before you had to test it and that kind of colored the way you were setting up the tests because yes. you were kind of taking shortcuts maybe not shortcuts but definitely sawing off the rounded rounding the corners and so stuff like the, that. and actually that approach led to two completely new ways of testing myths this season um, in a couple of weeks we have an A team special. Now, in the A-team, they were always finding themselves like, ah, we're in the lumberyard and the bad guys are coming. We've only got 45 minutes. What are we going to do? Let's uh, build a weapon out of what's here. So they built Non-lethal weapon, weapon, of course. (laughs) Non-lethal, yes, yes, right. So we built that weapon, and then we realized, okay, you know, it's it's, it's 80s television. Like, there's very little basis in reality for Mm -hmm. almost everything that they make. But what... If Jamie and I were stranded in a lumberyard with the exact same materials, what would we do? Ah. Yep. So that's what we did. And we steadfastly did not engage with the material of what we had at our disposal or really talking to each other about what design of machine we would build until the cameras were rolling. Oh, that's awesome. And then we get this completely genuine machine. A uh, second episode happens later on this season called uh, uh, The Transformers. Uh, there's a story about a Frenchman stranded in the desert with a Duchevaux, a little Citroën uh, uh, car. It mm-hmm. looks a little like a Beetle, but it predates it. by a the, w- the one with the cloth top, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this one not, but yes, it's that one you're thinking of. From, um, from The Professional or something like that. There's a, there's a famous car chase with those. No. Or maybe it's Italian job. Italian Not job Italian is, job. That's, that's a minis. Fiat. Those are minis. Oh, minis. Uh, but Dushevo, okay. with two wheels shattered, he turn, He takes the car apart and puts it back together in the form of a motorcycle. Okay. And when we were talking about this, we wanted, we wanted, we wanted to try something different. And so what we did was, we didn't look at the pictures of what he built. Mm. We did not engage oh. with his machine at all. We found the correct make and model of the car. We stranded ourselves in the middle of nowhere, which was a landfill uh, nearby. And using the same complement of hand tools and processes, we tried the same thing. And only then did we look at his design. And that was cool. Oh, I can't wait to see that. That was really awesome because... We presented ourselves with the same challenge. It's a totally different way of philosophically looking at the story. And when we were talking about it, I realized there's no downside to this. If we nail it, 
Well, that's awesome. But if we don't and we look, we got this second beat, we can go and try his version well, and see how that works. And it leans on the expertise you've built over the last 12 years, yes. which is the thing that was missing before. And makes it, well, I don't think that was, it was missing, missing before, but, yeah. but I think that I think that there are ways in which this extra time, is, the extra time we have to tell these stories. And again, that's the other thing. We're not telling three stories or four stories per episode, we're telling two. Mm-hmm. And um, it's always two-ish? It's always two-ish. Okay. I mean, it might be 2.3, you know, okay. a smaller, a small, small story. But for the most part, we have trouble making small stories. We tend to get interested and things get fat really quickly. Uh, but that extra time to tell the story has has felt a little like a luxury because, again, that story can get deeper and deeper. I, I was really surprised by the Simpsons episode, like the, by the by the outcome of yeah, the Homer. Yeah, I was surprised by both outcomes. I, I, I never imagined that you'd get the toilets to to flush in geyser form. And I was shocked that, I mean, I don't think Homer would have survived. <laughs> I don't think he would have survived, but I was shocked at the lack of damage on that second hit. Yeah, that was pretty I amazing. was really shocked. And mm-hmm. our, our uh, associate producer, Eric Haven, who is the genius at finding stuff, we really tasked him with the worst thing ever, which was find us two houses to destroy. <laughs> and that's why we had to build those because we looked, we looked everywhere within a thousand mile radius of Mythbusters and wow. couldn't find two houses to destroy. That were in the, yeah. That were, you know, in the, uh, we're about to be recycled. Let's accelerate the process. Well, you know, it's it's a matter of time. Hey, so we asked for some questions from the audience okay, yeah. before we started. Um, let's see. Uh, people are asking about episodes on Hulu. The new episode, the old episodes are on Hulu now. They're off yes. Netflix. Yeah. Are, is this new season going to be on Hulu as well? I, or I, that you don't is know? above my pay grade. Okay. I do not know. Um, I hope so. Uh, any plans for STEM and or GEMS? I don't know what GEMS is. I'm I assume STEM thing. is science, uh, yeah, science, technology, technology engineering, engineering, and math. However, it's STEAM. It's pronounced STEAM because you have to put art, art in there. Yeah. Um, Please. Do you have some some STEM episodes people can look forward to? I mean, they're all kind of STEM episodes, that, right? That, Mythbusters is STEM. STEAM. Okay. Mythbusters Steam, is sorry. STEAM. I mean, we are we are we are in of by and for and all about STEM. So yes. Um, do you, uh, do you, do you know what hardware you're using to do? Cause it seemed like you were doing some time lapses and motorized time lapses and stuff like uh, that. Yes. We have a couple of really cool oh, movers that's from now. We G-Whip. have some belt driven movers, um, with, with programmable heads so that you can get these long tracking shots that are also time lapse. And that's uh, Willie Nail's particular bailiwick, and he's been having lots of fun. That is not something, that, that is something that's tough to get right. Well, especially if you get one get, shot at it. It, it, it is. And uh, the one that he got that got the gasp at Comic Con was I was braiding a whip for the indie episode. This, this clip is online, so it's not mm-hmm. really a spoiler. I'm braiding a, a, a whip, and he has the camera underneath pointed up, tracking with my hands. And this is also me working with him. He, he's like, "Where? Are you, whenever I'm building, it's like, where are you going to be? I'm going to be within this frame. And then he shows me the frame. Okay, make it up a little bit because I'm probably going to... All right, now, okay, how long is this going to take? <sighs> <laughs> and like most That's of the time I get it wrong, the variable. there, are, there yeah. are times when I totally get it wrong and Will has to come in and redo it. I mean, and, and so all day long when I'm building, that's just one of the things that is constantly happening. And sometimes it doesn't make it into the episode. But uh, but it seemed like you guys spent a lot of time building this in this episode. That's about how much time we spend building every episode. Oh, you just weren't showing it there before. Is no, we're not doing any more physical work to make Mythbusters than we've ever done before. We are... It's just that there hasn't been shots of us building. So people automatically thought there's a whole team of people building mm-hmm. stuff for Adam and Jamie. There's not. What else you got? Um, let's see. Uh, Fred Smith wants to know what's the hardest thing about the new format. Is it just the, the extra onus on you guys to be the connective tissue? For me, uh, yeah. For me personally, um, you know, the the I work hand in glove with my executive producer, Dan Tapster, um, about how these stories fit together. And I love working with Dan. On the ground, Dan's not in San Francisco. He's across the world. And it's not like we can be in constant communication. Um, So every sequence has to follow every other sequence. You have to tell a cohesive story when you're not sure how the editors are going to cut it and you're not sure what the result of your experiment's going to be, which is usually. Uh, so that means the mental calisthenics that I have to do in working with my director, Steve Christensen, uh, and Jamie is significantly greater. 
Because you have to you have to keep all avenues open. All avenues open. You can't you can't shoot something that the editor can't cut with. So you've got to be thinking how might they cut with this? Where will this go? Where will that go? There might be a great thing you want to do, but there's no point to it. Or there doesn't fit within the story. It's too tangential. And you know that when they get into the editing room and stuff's got to get cut out. That's gonna be the one. That's oh, gonna that's, go. You don't ever want to spend a day building something, filming it. And not have it make it into the episode. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I know we've talked about this on this show before, and Norm and I feel the same way when we're shooting stuff. It's it's really um, like the worst thing I feel like I can do is waste everybody that's working with me's time. Yeah. Right. And well, and you don't know either. I mean, you you know, you, you sometimes the footage comes back, and the experiment was so much fun and screwed up so many times in so many hilarious ways that the first. A uh, rough cut comes in at like 60 minutes and they got to cut it down to 42 and a half. And you're like, oh man, well, it means a lot of new media for the web and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But still it's it, that again, those mental calisthenics of how does the sequence fit? Where do we start it? Where do we end it? Where do we, how do we talk about the stuff in the middle? Um, we have lists of things that we want to get to to touch upon this is important this is important this is important that, that's the mental work is has doubled to make the show for me i think that's about it i think this is as good a place right. as any to wrap up I'm, I'm i'm really excited about these episodes i'm glad we're talking about it within the run of the season and we should talk about indie next week because the indiana jones episode is a real stunner i and, and it's, i know it's close to you yeah, very close to my heart. I got to. I wore. I wore an indie costume every day for two and a half. Oh months. my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> because I could um, for work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching YouTube. Uh, like us on YouTube. Uh, review us on iTunes is the best thing you can do to help the show you right can now. Review us on iTunes. That would be awesome. Uh, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.